This is the voice of the Islamic Republic of Iran broadcasting. The voice of the Islamic Republic of Iran is broadcast daily from 1920 to 2020 UTC on the following frequencies. Short wave, 31 meters, 9,855 kHz for Europe and 31 meters. 9,835 kHz for Southern Africa. NFM, 91.5 MHz for Tehran. You can also listen to the voice of the Islamic Republic of Iran on Hot Third, Utilsat 3B, and Iran Sat for Bad Funds, and via Internet. Our Internet address is rsuday.com forward slash en. And now you can listen to IRIB English Radio via your mobile phone. Please refer to our website for the details.
in Western Europe rises to the 126. Russia reports 799 coronavirus-related deaths, the highest in a single day since the pandemic began. And South African President Cyril Ramaphosa says the deadly unrest in this country over the past week was planned in its own. Welcome everybody here in the Iranian capital, Shahan, this is World News. Our top story for this half hour, these 126 people have been killed in days of torrential rains and flooding in Western Europe. Germany is the worst affected country that has reported 103 fatalities so far. More than 1,300 people also remain unaccounted for. Officials in two German states of North Rhine, West Folly and Rhineland, Palatinate, have warned that the number could go up as the situation remains difficult to assess. Belgium has also confirmed at least 23 deaths. Luxembourg and the Netherlands have evacuated thousands of people. Meanwhile, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has reacted to the unprecedented situation, saying the floods are a clear indication of climate change. It is the intensity and the length of these events um, where science, science tells us this is a clear indication um, of uh, climate change. Speaking in the Irish capital, Dublin, von der Leyen added that the situation in Western Europe shows uh, urgency to act on climate change. German President Frank Walter Steinmeier has also expressed shock at the extent of damage, highlighting that it was time to battle climate change. More heavy rain has been predicted across the region with experts blaming climate change for the flooding. Well, Russia has uh, reported nearly 800 coronavirus-related new deaths, the highest in a single day since the pandemic broke out there. Friday night's the straight fourth uh, straight day the country has logged record daily fatalities from the virus. Russia's coronavirus task force also confirmed nearly 26,000 new infections for the past day. The country's total caseload is now inching closer to 6 million, while its death toll is hovering around 147,000. Russia has been grappling with the third wave of the pandemic since April. Obviously, the Delta variant and uh, people's reluctance to get vaccinated as the reason for the spike. The capital, Moscow, and the second largest city, St. Petersburg, remain the epicenters of the recent outbreak. Russia is the worst hit country in Europe by the pandemic in terms of both infection and death. Well, Iran has logged almost 22,000 new COVID-19 infections in the last 24 hours, raising its total caseload to nearly 3.5 million. The health ministry uh, also confirms some 200 new fatalities for the past day. The country's death toll from the virus is now inching close to 87,000. Over 4,000 COVID patients are currently in intensive care units. Iran has been grappling with a new surge in infections and deaths over the past couple of weeks. The uptick is largely blamed on the highly contagious Delta strain of the virus. 
Nearly 170 cities are now designated as what? The highest level in the country's four-tier system of COVID restrictions. Stringent measures are uh, in place in those cities to curb the spread of the virus. So far, nearly two and a half million people have received two doses of a COVID vaccine nationwide. And South Korean authorities are considering tighter coronavirus restrictions as the number of daily infections uh, keep surging there. The government says gatherings would be limited to less than four people in non-metropolitan area after 6 p.m. as cases continue to rise. Such limits, along with other curbs, have already been in place in the greater Seoul area since Monday. The region accounted for about 75% of the nearly 1,500 cases posted Thursday. South Korea so far have been uh, successful in controlling its COVID outbreaks. However, the more contagious Delta variant has fueled the fourth wave of infections among the unvaccinated. Daily infections uh, there have been 1,000 or above since July the 7th. South Korea has been hit hard by a fourth wave of the COVID-19 pandemic with new daily cases over 1,000 for the past week. More than 50% of the recent new cases have been the more contagious Delta variant. The government has issued a number of restrictions and guidelines, including banning gatherings of more than two people, other than family, after 6 p.m. Please refrain from going out or holding social gatherings and abide by the disinfection guidelines wherever you are. Even if you don't have symptoms, please protect yourself and your loved ones by getting tested. We can and must overcome this crisis. The government will do its best. Bae Young Wan and his wife operate a small seafood restaurant in Incheon, just outside of Seoul. He diligently disinfects his restaurant, adhering to social distancing protocols and other government guidelines. He says a lot of businesses in the neighborhood are just hanging on. The current situation is affecting us tremendously. Up to now, the first to third waves of the coronavirus weren't so bad. But as soon as the fourth wave started, from the first day, the number of customers plunged by 80 to 90 percent. As many countries around the world are now opening up, South Korea is under more pressure from the rest of the public to respond more effectively to the outbreak. Young people have been especially critical as they will wait months for their shots amid shortages of vaccine supplies. The South Korean government had set a goal of November to achieve herd immunity. Currently, about 12% of the population has been fully vaccinated, while health officials emphasize the importance of the next two months in containing the recent wave of infections. Frank Smith, Seoul. South African President Sarah Ramaphosa says, the deadly unrest in this country over the past week was planned in advance. And it's quite clear that this, all these incidents of unrest and looting were instigators. They were instigators. There were people who planned it. They coordinated it. Ramaphosa expressed concern over rising racial tensions in some parts of the country. He said his government would not allow anarchy and mayhem to prevail. The South African president was speaking to media as he visited KwaZulu Natal province. That's one of the worst hit areas in the unrest. The violence broke out after former President Jacob Zuma began his 15-month jail term for refusing to appear at a corruption inquiry. Officials say 117 people were killed and more than 1,700 arrested. They also say a dozen suspects have been identified in connection with the violence. Iran's foreign minister has dismissed U.S. allegations that Iranian intelligence services were involved in an abduction plot on American soil. Mama Jawazeri said the alleged kidnapping operation was, quote, patently ridiculous and childishly conceived. He added the accusation is aimed at covering up Washington's own criminal ties to gunmen acting plots in the U.S. to assassinate leaders in Venezuela and Haiti. He called on the U.S. to put its uh, house in order before throwing bricks at others. On Tuesday, the U.S. Justice Department accused four Iranian intelligence agents of conspiring to kidnap an anti-Islamic Republic figure in New York for rendition to Iran. Cuban President Miguel Diaz Canel says the United States' efforts to destroy his country have failed despite spending billions of dollars to do so. Diaz Canel said a failed state is the one that multiplies the damage to 11 million human beings 
ignoring the will of the majority of Cubans, Americans, and the international community. He said such a policy is to uh, prove itself by blackmailing a reactionary minority. He cited the U.S. trade embargo in place against his country since 1962, which was enforced under former President Donald Trump. The reaction came after U.S. President Joe Biden on Thursday described Cuba as a failed state and accused it of, rep of uh, repressing its citizens. The Caribbean island nation has been witnessing anti-government protests since Sunday over the worst economic crisis in decades. Cuba has blamed the United States for the unrest. Now, Afghan officials say government forces have launched an operation to retake a key border crossing with Pakistan from Taliban militants. Heavy fighting is going on in the uh, Spindle-Dak border crossing as Taliban insurgents have reportedly taken shelter in civilian homes. The border point provides direct access to Pakistan's Balochistan province. That's where the Taliban's top leadership has been based for decades now. The crossing fell to the Taliban earlier this week. The militant group has also captured Afghan border crossings with Iran and Turkmenistan. Uh, they stepped up their attacks in May, taking control of a swath of territories in Afghanistan. The military has pledged to retake all of those areas. Of course, Bonner Tommy Nalini quotes Afghan authorities as saying, the military is regaining control of some territories captured by the Taliban. The Afghan government officials uh, uh, here in Afghanistan for the House Ministry says that Afghan military forces have retaken uh, the control over some of key districts, mainly in northern and southern parts of Afghanistan. One of those uh, key districts and areas is Ispin Buldak, that connects uh, southern Kandahar province to uh, neighboring Pakistan. Ispin Buldak is also home to the former uh, police uh, commander of uh, Kandahar province who was well known for his anti-Taliban stance. Uh, after capturing this uh, area, I mean it's in Buldak, the Taliban militants also uh, entered the house of uh, this uh, former uh, Kandahar police chief and uh, even uh, burnt all of uh, what was what were inside this house. In the meantime, the Taliban uh, spokesman also says that they have uh, gained major achievements not only in Ispin Buldak but also in Wish, that is the main border point between uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan in uh, the southern parts of uh, southern part of this country. On the other hand, the Afghan government officials say that uh, Afghan military forces have re uh, taken uh, Chahan Su district from the Taliban. Uh, militants uh, located in uh, western Nimruz province, uh, in southern Nimruz province of Afghanistan. With the European Union threatening to impose sanctions against Sudanese politicians, Saad Hadi has decided to step down certain fundamental disagreements with President. Our experts believe the current socio-economic, financial, and political collapse could be the end of the current governing system in Lebanon. Following a declaration by Saad Hariri that he would step down as Prime Minister, President Engelmov block roads and clash with the army. The price of the dollar against the Lebanese lira was skyrocketing, shifting a gloomy outlook in the horizon. In an interview Thursday night, Hariri blamed President Aron for impeding the cabinet formation process and for his resignation. The group led by the President has decided not to cooperate with Saad Hariri. And all the obstacles that I have faced are because of that group. I did not want to just negotiate while knowing that I cannot form a cabinet. So I resigned because it seemed to me that President Aoun does not want to form a cabinet. Presidential office slammed Hariri for his comments, declaring that Hariri was, quote, not ready to discuss amendments of any kind and closed the door on any talk. Experts see that Hariri is now launching an internal conflict, using resistance as a scapegoat. It was obvious that he is uh, preparing for his uh, campaign, election campaign, because uh, uh, later uh, in his interview yesterday night, uh, he launched his election campaign by uh, opening fire on uh, the resistance in Lebanon. Observers see that talk of electoral campaigns will be the main focus in the post Hadoui resignation era. The Americans, they haven't reached a point um, to let the solution take place. They are still uh, using the financial crisis as a blackmailing means to, uh, to blackmail, to try to blackmail uh, the resistance in Lebanon. The state of despair on the streets of Beirut is a reflection.
destruction of the general situation. Everyone knew there would not be a new cabinet. The country has collapsed. If the prime minister wanted to actually form a cabinet, he would go for real negotiations. The result will be death of the people, no electricity, no water, and no fuel. Lebanon has fallen. Lebanon has fallen. All the people need to protest. The rich and the poor are equal now, and all six are facing the same crisis. They all want a piece of cheese for themselves. People cannot rule right. They should leave. People are helpless. Hungary knows no religion or sex. With the socio-economic crisis quickly escalating, many believe the end result will be a probable demise of the entire political system. Trans Force has described Hariri's move as cynical self-destruction for the political class. Others considered it the start of an electoral campaign. But one thing all sides agree on is that it puts Lebanon in the face of a chaotic period ahead. Maryam Saleh, Beirut. The United Arab Emirates is moving closer to Israel despite widespread calls to reconsider its policy toward the regime. Economic considerations are largely at play when it comes to the controversial detente. The United Arab Emirates is among a group of Arab states that have normalized ties with the Israeli regime as part of a controversial initiative brokered by the United States and condemned by Palestinians. The Emiratis, who have been particularly open about their ongoing normalization process, opened an embassy in Israel this week. The U.S. have never been known for having an independent foreign policy. It has never stood for the rights of Palestinian people. Historically and recently, as you've seen, the U.S. has always aligned this foreign policy with the foreign policy objectives of Western countries like the U.S. and U.K. The new embassy is located in the heart of Israel's financial hub, Tel Aviv Stock Exchange Building. This is seen by many as a sign that the two sides are highlighting the role of economic cooperation in their normalization of ties. Last month, Israel opened an embassy in the Emirati capital, Abu Dhabi, and a consulate in the UAE's business hub, Dubai. Over the past year, the two sides have signed many deals, ranging from financial services to tourism. Critics say Emirati leaders have totally abandoned the Palestinian cause for the economic and political dividends of ties with the Israeli regime. The controversial normalization process is very much ongoing despite Palestinian anger. Palestinians are outraged by the normalization, which they believe is threatening their planned statehood. The stances adopted by these Arab governments seem to be helping the Israeli regime to move out of deep isolation in the West Asia region. Palestinians say those Arab states are stabbing them in the back. And I bring this to an end here on this edition of World News News System of
path towards enlightenment. In the name of God, the all compassionate, the all merciful. Salam and welcome to another episode of our weekly series titled Path Towards Enlightenment which is an endeavor to make you enough familiar with an easy and fluent explanation of God's final scripture to all mankind, the Noble Quran, which was revealed to the last and greatest of all messengers, Prophet Muhammad, blessings of God upon him and his progeny. As you know from our explanation so far of Surah Fah, or Manifest Victory, that God Almighty describes the Prophet's treaty of good idea with the pagan Arabs of Mecca, therefore the same tribes who claim to be Muslim, but whose hearts were devoid of Islam, disobeyed divine commandments, and resorted to lame excuses, lies, and hypocrisy for their failure to accompany the faithful, since their main concern with booty and no faith, even though the All-Merciful readily forgives those who repent and reform. We continue from where we left you in our last episode a fortnight ago, and here is Ayah 15 of Surah Fat. سيقول المخلفون إذا انطلقتم إلى مغانم لتأخذوها ذرونا نتبعكم يريدون أن يبدلوا كلام الله ولن تتبعونا كذلكم قال الله من قبل فسيقولون بل تحسدوننا بل كانوا لا يفقهون إلا قليلا those who lagged behind a good idea, they say, when you set out to capture booty or favor, let us follow you. They desire to change the word of Allah. Say, O prophet, unto them, you shall not follow us. Thus has Allah said in a battle. Then they will say, you are envious of us. Rather, they do not understand, but a little. In our last episode of this series, a fortnight ago, we explained the preceding ideas of this surah, saying, Wrong assumptions bring ruin and self-destruction, especially when divine laws are deliberately disobeyed. Since our faith depends on our faith, and the deeds we do, whether good or bad, which either bring divine rewards or divine punishment. We also said that excessive attachment to worldly positions hinders people from fulfilling their religious duties. However, the all-merciful life has left the doors of repentance wide open, and his warnings of punishment as well as the tidings of reward are intent to give hope to the sinners and even to the disbelievers of acceptance of forgiveness through return to the straight and unwavering path. The only that we reported to you now was revealed to the campaign of Khibar against the rebellious Israeli tribe who, along the pagan Arabs, were hatching a plot to attack Medina and kill the Prophet. So, the Prophet, soon after his return to Medina, decided to proceed towards Khaybar and declared that he would take him only those who had accompanied him to good idea because 
the Bedouin tribe that did not accompany him on that journey and now wanted to do in their greed the workings for divinely debarred from joining the jihad. Jihad means to strive with in burden for the sake of Allah and benefit of humanity, whether in war or in peace. In other words, Jihad is not for personal gain or booty. These were the facts that the Bedouin Arab tribes came to understand because of their lack of faith. Although they were clever in worldly matters, they were ignorant of the spiritual issues and wrongly said the Muslims and the Prophet were envious of them. This ayah teaches us that, number one, divine mercy precedes divine wrath. And it is only added that bring us reward or punishment. Number two, most Bedouin tribes paid only lip service to Islam, while their hearts would be under faith in God and the Prophet. Number three, among the characteristics of hypocrites is that they are opportunistic. They leave the scene at the time of danger by resorting to various pretexts, but in easy game, they want to have the major share in them. And number four, it is the habit of the hypocrite to accuse the faithful in a bid to cover up their own faults and crimes. Listen to Ayah 16 of this surah as the concluding ayah of this week's episode. Unilmukhalafina min al a'rabi satuda'una ila qawmin uli ba'sin Say to the Bedouins who lag behind, you will be called against the people of a great mind. They will embrace Islam, or you will fight them. So, if you obey, Allah will give you a good reward. But if you turn away, like you turned away before, He will punish you with a painful punishment. This ayah means to tell the Bedouin Arab who had disobeyed the Prophet's command and failed to accompany believers at Khodaibiyye and then offered their apologies in order to participate in the campaign of Teva for a share of foils you shall be soon called to fight ferocious opponents who will be called and the embrace the truth of Islam. If you obey divine commandments and fight for Allah's cause, He will grant you fair reward, but if you turn away, as you have done before, you will be punished by God Almighty. If you are really regretful of your past, you can prove your honesty in the coming hardship, since God has kept the door of repentance open for you. You should, however, not enter the battlefield with the expectation of booty. In this way, you will receive the mercy that God bestows upon the combatants adhering to the right path. From this eye, we will learn the following points. Number one. The door of repentance is wide open for sinners and disbelievers as part of divine mercy. Number two, we should never underestimate the enemy and never consider past victories as a guarantee for future success. Number three, the Muslims ought to build a formidable tower of defense to deter the enemy from any evil design and to defeat him if they attack. And number four, 
jihad, whether it is peaceful, rising, or defense against enemies on the battlefield, is for the sake of God and safeguarding of humanitarian values and not any ulterior motive. that the Quran uses is to talk to the emotional side of the human being. And we have set forth for many times in this Quran full of examples. Then that, a lecture on Islamic issues. You show me the way of life, a complete way. It's a complete way. Dear listeners of IRID English Radio, now let's listen to Brother Hasnain Rajabali. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. May Allah bless you all for joining us tonight. If we practice religion well, or at least in a way where we have an open mind, where we wish to question things and to get closer to Allah, our children will practice the same behaviors and they will get closer and become leaders of the, of the society. And you made a very critical point about unity. Quran addresses this, Hold on to the rope of Allah together and don't deviate. We always think we have differences of opinion that have become a tool and a means by which to cause us to regret. And the minute you start talking about unity, the satanic elements as well, if you unite, you're going to have to give up your principles, you see. You may have to adapt to the other person's ideas, and that, that may not be such a good idea. You know, when you have an interfaith dialogue, and you're going to call people of other faiths, like Buddhists and Christians and Jews, you may have to do things that you may not like, and that may be in violation. It, is, it appears like to be, you know, this is much of a very, uh, what we call a careful approach. And it's okay, thank you for informing me of that. Should I not do it? The answer is, قُلْ يَا أَهْلِ الْكِسَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ أَنْ لَا نَعْبِدَا إِلَّا اللَّهِ All people of the book, Allah says, say, O people of the command, فَأَمِ الْأَمَرِ Come, تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ Let's have a dialogue between us that we worship none other than one God. It's such a beautiful, magnificent attraction that we live in the Western world. We have other schools of thought that are doing much more than us, and we're talking a lot about the coming of the Imam, and we don't do this within our community. In fact, with our own communities, I'm sorry to say that, but that's the truth, and we need to get out of it, is we're culturally bound. If I'm from this country and this culture, if somebody from another culture comes, eh, you're like a hindrance to me, you know? You're sort of disrupting my free flow of my expression of cultures. You know, and, I, and when I go to monolithic societies, so you have no idea what you're missing out. Diversity is the spice to life. And then other people have different opinions. And let them ask you why you believe in God. And let them tell you they believe in more than one God. Let them say they don't believe in a God. That's beautiful. Engage in it. This way you get stronger in your own family. And you know, it's interesting that the world is rich with these kinds of uh, opportunities. When I travel the world, I find Christian groups inviting us. You know, after 9-11, I was invited to more churches and synagogues than ever in my life. You know, after 9-11, everybody would be shutting their doors and no one wants to talk to a Muslim. And rather, we're being invited everywhere. Today, the media is ever ready to capture us to say something. Of course, they would like us to say something bad so that they can get greater ratings. But we're going to beat them to it. And we're going to look at them straight in the land and tell them this is what Islam is about. Now go edit what you want. But we're going to keep telling you this. Because that's the truth. And if you don't like it, no problem. We're going to act on it one on one in the, at, at work with our neighbors. And we're going to distribute food and help the needy because that's what my religion promotes. I think that's the key. Unity 
And you know, on the flip side, I'll give you one quick point. I was having a dialogue with a pastor, uh, with a, with a, with a uh, in New Zealand. Their church burnt down. Pastor Tulamina. Beautiful human being. Full of love and compassion. Their church burnt down. And they raised money. And they rebuilt their church. But when they rebuilt it, something very interesting. So the pastor is telling me, so we decided that it was time to unite with the people in our community. And that we should all worship God. And we decided not to have the cross. We wanted to have a place of worship for people of all faiths to come into our building. And then on Sundays, we bring a, what we call a mobile cross. And we do our Sunday Mass. But we remove it so that we want to give everybody their free space. Because we feel we all worship in God together. Muslim, Christian, Jew, Buddhist. Worshiping God together has greater power than us just worshiping God within our own little circle. Wow. And I looked at the wow. How many of us would have the guts to do that? No, we would say, no, 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 you remove that cross. My identity is gone. Tomorrow there will be no cross. No, 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 I can't do that. I've got to protect my religion. And what's happened is we become protectionists. And then our children tomorrow, anyone come to church, don't come to the mosque. According to the Detroit, uh, you know, Archdiocese of Detroit, 95% of Catholic youth never enter a church. 95% in Germany on Christmas Eve, there are so many people, because everybody wants to go on Christmas Eve, that the local congregants in Germany complain that they have no, no space to come and worship on that day. Well, here is the point of view, it's empty, or it's low participation. And suddenly one day everybody shows up. Now you can look at it two ways. So thank God they all come that one day. Thank God there's room, there's hope there. So let them come for that one day. Maybe that one day will inspire them to do two days, maybe five days, maybe a month, maybe six months, maybe 365. We can look at that way too. But we can say, well, nobody comes to church except on that day. Well, that's a problem too. So why do we only come and take the pill one day? Like us, even us. I mean, they, you know, I saw people don't even pray, they come and show themselves up for Ashura. People say, this is Monate, this guy, is a, you know, a hypocrite, he's coming one day. I said, stop. He loves Imam Hussein. Yeah, but he's drinking. I said, stop. He's got Imam Hussein in his house. For God's sake, stop the hope we have. Hold on, bring him. Well, that one day. Maybe that will speak to two days. Maybe to ten days. Maybe tomorrow he'll drop his alcoholic behavior and he'll drop his bad behavior or her bad behavior because they love him. They love God. The love of God is true perfect in the Imam. What we find is that we need to encourage each other. Unity. We need to be pragmatic and possible. But there's so much to talk about. We're out of time. And we're really, really honored that we have an audience that's listening to this. And they continue to listen to it globally around the world. And we see that this message is for all of us as a human race. During this COVID situation, there are people who don't have food. I just watched a video today. A group of brothers where the uh, Middle Eastern restaurant decided to open up and make food and feed the hungry and make a thousand dishes, you know, thousand, they feed a thousand people a day. In Australia, you know, but, uh, you know uh, the Hussein, mashallah, Haji said, he's doing the same thing. He's coming over the news. Muslims are doing this. This is the practice. The Christians doing this. People of other faiths doing it. Let's take care of the needy. We're losing people sometimes, not necessarily because of COVID, but because of depression. There is an increased state of, for example, uh, domestic violence because of this problem. We are neighbors. We see that situation. We see a child in bruised. Do something. Let's, let's get engaged. That is what the Imam wants to see. But the Muslims are an example of that locksmith. The Imam is saying, if you're honest, I will visit you. You don't have to find me. I know who you are. I will visit you. People say, I want the Imam to visit me. You know how the Imam visits when you and I do his work? Then he's visiting us. You don't know that one person comes to say, I'm alaykum, very good job. Salaam alaykum, thank you. You have no idea that was the Imam was just saying, thank you. You have no idea. Does it matter? No. What matters is, is Allah pleased with me? And am I going to stand on judgment day having done something? <laughs>
log on to our website www.pastoday.com forward slash en. The UK government has announced the removal of all public health measures, meaning that population immunity has to do all the work. With millions of people still without the protection of full vaccination or previous infection, it is inevitable that a good chunk of that immunity will come from new infection rather than vaccination. Dear listeners, this was part of an article written by Christina Pago, Director of UCL Clinical Operational Research Unit. This article is published under the heading, Boris Johnson gave two reasons for lifting all restrictions. Both are wrong. Here's more on the story. The war was 194,000 new cases of COVID-19 reported in England last week, which is 35% more than the week before. At the time of writing, 52% of UK population had been fully vaccinated. Perhaps another 20% has some immunity from one dose of vaccine or previous COVID infection. If this level of population immunity was enough to contain the pandemic alongside public health measures, cases would be falling. They are falling and it isn't enough. So cases will keep rising, currently doubling every fortnight or so until either population immunity is high enough or Public health measures are effective enough for a combination of both to hold COVID to spread. The government recently announced the removal of all public health measures, meaning that population immunity has to do all the work. With millions of people still without the protection of full vaccination or previous infection, it is inevitable that a good chunk of that immunity will come from new infection rather than vaccination. Public Health England estimated three more doublings of cases before the peak, potentially meaning more than 200,000 cases a day in six weeks' time. Even the Health Secretary, Sajid Javi, consists there are likely to be more than 100,000 cases a day, ensuring around two more doublings, which would be higher than the highest recorded day in January. This could easily mean another 2 million people infected before cases return to the low levels we saw in early May. Meanwhile, the report suggests the government is already planning for a fourth wave this autumn due to the return to school and university, colder weather, and some waning of vaccine effectiveness over time. The question then is, how much millions more cases matter, given the economic and mental health benefits of further opening? The Prime Minister stood out two main arguments in favor of further easing. The first is that well over 90% of the most at risk people are fully vaccinated greatly weakening the link between new infections and hospitalizations. The second is that it is better to have mass infection now rather than in the winter when the virus spreads more easily and the NHS is more stressed. 
Both are wrong. More than 100 scientists set out why allowing mass infection this summer was a terrible idea in a letter to the Lancet last week. Dr. Mike Ryan, the executive director of the World Health Organization's Health Emergency Program, called such a strategy moral emptiness and epidemiological stupidity. Health care experts for the People's COVID Inquiry called it a dangerous experiment. The British Medical Association, the Association of Directors of Public Health, SAGE, and NHS leaders have all highlighted the danger of allowing mass infection. Your hospitalizations than would be the case without a vaccine. Hospital admissions are nonetheless rising exponentially. A few or three more doublings, we could be seeing more than 2,000 admissions a day by mid August. A significant burden on a health service that is already under immense strain, with some hospitals having canceled elective surgeries and delayed cancer treatment. The last thing. The NHS needs as it tries to cope with its backlog of 5 million patients is a return to giving up what an idea for COVID care. Second, the infection comes with a high burden of long COVID. The Office for National Statistics estimates about 1 million people, including 33,000 children, currently live with long COVID in the UK. With 385,000 having symptoms for more than a year, and over 600,000 think it adversely impacts their daily life. With infections falling mainly on unvaccinated young, we risk the burdening a generation with long-term ill health. Both the chief medical officer, Chris Rudy, and the chief executive of NHS providers, Dr. Chris Hobson, have expressed great concern over the prospect of hundreds of thousands more cases of long COVID over the coming months. Third, every new infection presents an opportunity for further mutations of the virus, and any that can better infect the vaccine will have a large selection advantage. We have really seen the impact of the Delta variant over the past few months. Do we really want to work our way through this great alphabet? Four, opening further has been there rest for a day, but for many it is anything but. Those living with health conditions that make them more vulnerable to COVID still intend to shelter indoors as they are no longer protected by low infection rates and measures such as mass wearing and physical distancing. As uh, even vaccinated people can do, yeah. can transmit the virus to many of their friends and relatives. Two, will restrict their activities to protect loved ones. For many, listen to COVID rules, they restrict rather than enable their freedom. All of this is unnecessary. People have safe and highly effective vaccines that work for use in everyone over the age of 12. There are excellent vaccination programs around the world. Evidence suggests that immunity derived from vaccination is more robust than immunity from infection, particularly against new variants. People could offer two doses of vaccine to everyone over 12 by the autumn, offering as many people as possible the protection of vaccination rather than the gamble of infection. The argument that delaying that will only result in more infections later in the winter ignores three things. The protection of illness more including adolescents can have from vaccination. The potential for vulnerable adults to receive booster shots in autumn. 
Essentially, due to offset the additional infection rate, a winter the public health measure. If you accept that infection, both matter and are avoidable, then it's not about feather opening and July 19th. It can only make things good. But about what we can do now to hold exponential growth and bring down cases. So, governments need to act quickly and act decisively with a strategic testing, contact tracing, and supported isolation, including the vaccinated in all regions. Learning from successful efforts in different regions. In this summer, a continued requirement to work with home when possible and with short lived restrictions such as to outdoor dining if local directors of public health consider it necessary. A mask wearing made compulsory again in secondary schools. Any brief return to restrictions must come with financial support for those people and businesses affected.